Yo, 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 welcome to Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. Today on the show, we've got your boy in Paris, Victor Wimbignana taking one step closer to a signature shoe status, a WrestleMania recap, the week's hottest release, and of course, our Hard Pass. All right, as usual, let's start the show with our trip from Paris. As you can see, I am not at the studio for Hard Pass. I am in Paris, France to attend the Nike On Air experience, a preview of what we can expect to see Nike athletes rock when they take the stage for the biggest event in sports, the Summer Olympics. I had a chance to check out the Nike DNA display, get hands on with the new Pegasus Premium that drops in 2025, and the GT Hustle 3, which looks kind of crazy, but more on that later. I gotta say, as somebody who never met anybody else named Jacques growing up, it was cool being in a place where my name is as common as co-writer's name is in Southern California. Wait, just received a mess message. What does this say? He doesn't have a problem sharing a name with a lot of people, but he does have a problem with people mispronouncing his other name. Other name? What? What other? Even in Paris, I can't escape co-writer. All right. As for what to expect to see over the next few months, Nike's 13 shoe blueprint pack encompasses a huge swath of shoes that we will see on Nike athletes as they compete in the Olympics. The pack is named after Nike co-founder Bill Bowerman and his pursuit of optimizing athlete performance. The key inspirations found on the shoe are the topography that's lifted directly from Bowerman's handwriting and the blue ink dots that form the swooshes were a personal touch that Bowerman used to reduce the weight of the shoe instead of stitching on the now iconic Nike logo. The shoes that have me most intrigued based on what we were told are the Zoom Mercurial 2024, the Nike GT Hustle 3, and the Nike Pegasus 41. We don't talk much about the Pegasus on this show, but they are among Nike's best selling models throughout the year, and they have a following that's not unlike what we see with their yearly Air Max models or ASICs with the JL Kayano line. It's coming with a new React X foam that provides 13% more energy return compared to the React foam. Meanwhile, the GT Hustle 3 claims to reduce your workload since you're using less oxygen, which should help me as I'm wheezing up and down the court trying to hang with these kids. And then there's the Air Zoom Mercurial boot, which is actually using an update to the Air Zoom unit that they've had on the Mercurial since 2022. The idea that air is being used on the pitch is a little wild to me since they want their feet as close to the ground as possible, but if Nike and their athletes see the results like they claim, they seem to have found the magic formula, I guess. And while most of these shoes are going to be on our feet by summertime, Nike did also tease something big in 2025. They introduced the Nike Pegasus Premium, featuring the first ever sculpted visible Zoom Air unit that is contoured to our feet. With Zoom X Foam on the midsole, React X Foam on the heel, Nike is claiming it's springy and smooth feel. It's something that we've never experienced on a Zoom platform previously. There's a lot of tech going on in this runner, and I'm gonna be curious to see, since it does have the premium name attached, if this is going to be something that they market to the masses who maybe want a step up from the base model Pegasus, or if this is something that's made for the serious athlete who has no problem spending $300 or more for the runners. Of course, I'm also interested in the potential that this has for basketball signature shoes, like whatever they have planned for Wimby, or for the Nike LeBron 22, or for the 23. I actually had a chance to try them on, and they feel unlike anything I've felt from Nike before. All right. Let's start with some hot takes. So the countdown to a Victor Wimbenyama signature shoe begins as we've gotten our first look at his logo to go alongside a Nike GT Hustle 2 player exclusive. The symbol is basically our interpretation of what an alien looks like as it represents the out of this world game that Wimby possesses. I mean, look at this sham god into a spin move he pulls against the Grizzlies. I mean, the sham god was crazy enough, but then to recognize the defender behind him and spin out of it, like, Wimby really is the first creative player you make when you fire up NBA 2K, where you just bump all the sliders up to 99. Now, a signature shoe always felt inevitable for Wimby. The question is whether or not the sneakerhead community and the greater casual audience is ready for it. The old adage of big men not selling shoes might not apply to Wimby because A, his game and swagger is built for the Gen Z and younger crowd that goes out of their way to piss off old adages, and B, Nike can't afford to mess this one up. Whatever they've got cooking in the lab can't be your typical sneaker that's only built for hooping. It needs to be the sneaker that kids can feel comfortable wearing on and off the court. Basically, if the book one was the Nintendo Wii U, the Wimby one needs to be the Nintendo Switch. You know, apologies to Booker, I actually like the book one. But the internet seems to dislike it with a passion for reasons that go beyond the multitude of PEs that he wears. Strange behavior, people. Like, when did the book one become the Chef Curry's? Seriously. 
Every sneaker post lately has somebody commenting that they like whatever shoe is featured better than the book ones or just firing a stray and saying the book one sucks. I haven't seen this much disdain for a signature shoe in a long time, maybe since the Chef Curry's. And the funny thing is that the book ones are not easy to find online outside of reseller platforms. So this is actually a question for you. Where did Nike and Booker go wrong in the execution? Was it the marketing, the distribution of the book one? And has the hate for the shoes reached meme status? And is it just a thing people say because it's cool to say because they don't actually believe or have an opinion one way or another? Like, I'm so confused. Anyway, we got to look at Drake's Air Jordan 20 player exclusive and the use of the word player there. It's kind of funny though if you think about it, but I'm glad the 20s are getting some much deserved respect around here. And on the flip side, PJ Tucker might not like his situation in LA, but at least he's making the most of it with his Kentucky versus Texas Nike book one player exclusives. Okay, now the word player makes sense. And oh, if your Yeezy pods were made in Italy, they cost $200. If they were made in China, they cost $20. Wow, Kanye's so smart. He made his own reps. Hmm. Anyway, uh, shout out to Merrill. They made what the Yeezy Pods should have been. Now, if these were $200 and made in Italy, I might actually be tempted to buy a pair. And if they were $20 and made in China, that's even better. Look, we haven't been the biggest fans of whatever it is that Dot Swoosh is doing. But even I have to admit, the blue screen of death Air Force One they're dropping through some arcane process that I can't be bothered to look up has me in the nostalgic feels. I mean, I don't see that kind of anymore since I switched to Max, but the memories of seeing that blue screen when I went to a website I wasn't supposed to or tried to play the OG StarCraft on the computer that clearly could not handle it was simpler times, man. Simpler times. But let's get to the present. WWE Roman Reigns revealed before his main event matches last weekend at WrestleMania that he received a pretty sizable care package from Jordan Brand, shout out to Reggie. Like, we already knew that Reigns was in the same meeting that DJ Khaled keeps talking about, but this is God mode, as the tribal chief likes to say. And the best part, and probably why Jordan Brand loves Roman, he wears the Team J's with the same pride as he does the hot exclusives. It's called selling people, and Roman does that better than most in the ring and on the socials. I can't believe a wrestler understands that better than most of these celebrities. For Mania, Reigns received co-branded Jordan sneakers that include his logo, the Jordan boots he wore for his matches, and some very cool gear that read Air Reigns instead of Air Jordan. I mean, Triple H did mention on his episode of Sneaker Shopping that it's about time someone in the WWE got a deal. And this feels like a sign that something could be on the way. So is it gonna be called Jordan Tribal Chiefs, Jordan Head of the Tables, or Jordan Reigns? That last one actually kind of sounds like someone who could be on the bloodline next week. All right. Let's move on to our pick of the week. It's the F1 Puma Miami Grand Prix collection. This is gonna be on April 15th. So the Miami Grand Prix is a few weeks away and Puma is celebrating the occasion with the special South Beach themed pairs of the Velocity Nitro 3 and the Leadcat 2.0 slides. Will we see these on the feet of F1's best drivers throughout the week as they try to stay within striking distance of Max Verstappen? Oh, who, who am I kidding? No to catching up to Max until like 2026 at the very earliest unless he decides to take his talents to a different team because of all the internal drama at Red Bull is just untenable. So we have the F1 Puma Velocity Nitro 3 Miami Grand Prix on the 15th and the Leadcat 2.0 slides same day called the Miami Grand Prix. All right, wrestling's done. Stories finished. Rock and the man we can't see have gone back to Hollywood. But before we say goodbye to sports entertain, I mean, pro wrestling until maybe SummerSlam or until Roman Reigns comes back with a Jordan signature boot as the biggest baby face to take on final Bosch Rocky. Here's a recap of our 10 favorite things from WrestleMania. Xavier Woods paying homage to the late Carl Weathers when he dressed up as his old gimmick, Consequences Creed, which is an homage to Apollo Creed. How Woods hasn't made even at least a cameo in the Creed movies is beyond me. Snoop Dogg on the call for what should have been the most throwaway match on the card between Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits against the Final Testament made it 10 times more interesting than it had any right to be. Bailey finally getting her solo WrestleMania moment and receiving her well-deserved flowers after having to carry the women's division through the pandemic era without getting a main event spotlight because some people thought she was a level below her fellow four horsewomen. R-Truth winning at Mania for the first time on the heels of a hot storyline between himself and the Judgment Day, and like Bailey, finally getting his flowers after a long and at times scary absence due to injury. 
uh, Sami Zayn, proving that even though he got a spotlight match two years ago against a celebrity and main evented WrestleMania Saturday last year, you can still get the crowd behind you as an underdog when your opponent is an unbeatable brick wall who is destined for bigger things next year. Drew McIntyre showing some decent range during his championship match against Seth Rollins as he went from unsufferable troll to euphoria after he finally won the championship in front of fans to become a troll again to dismay after losing the said championship to Damian Priest. Jade Cargill, Naomi, Bianca Belair, damn. I mean, what else is there to say other than they killed it and if they stick together as a faction, they're gonna be OP as all hell. Seth freaking Rollins proving that you can do long-term storytelling in pro wrestling and that the audience doesn't have the attention span of Doug from Up. He pulled from his entire WWE history, from the shield to the architect to the visionary to guy who wears Nike Fear of Gods. Low key, Seth was MVP of the weekend. Triple H kicking off an era where he was the clear-cut head of creative by having the foresight and the guts to pivot when it was necessary, i.e. turning Rock heel and seeing a decision throughout to the end, i.e. booking Cody to win before Roman could surpass racist dumpster fires Hulk Hogan's modern day record. And for actually doing the Avengers in-game sequence that some fans, including us, fantasy booked. Did not expect The Undertaker choke slamming Rocky in the Hoka boots though. That was perfect. And finally, The Rock, following through on his final boss persona, even when there were so many opportunities for him to become a good guy again because he needs to sell his Papa Tui skincare products that are plastered all over targets across the country. Okay, now the real work begins because there are no off seasons and the show must go on. The clock is ticking and new stories have to be told. Now that Cody Rhodes has finished his particular story and both Rocky and Roman will be off television for a while, it's only a matter of time before the fans turn on Cody. Look, it happens to all super popular good guys. The crowd gets behind them because they're on a massive chase of the championship, and when they finally win, it's an amazing moment. What WWE has never been good at is the follow through. From Dumpster Fire Hogan to John Cena to Brian Danielson to Kofi Kingston to Becky Lynch, their success rate in keeping a baby face hot after winning a championship after a prolonged journey is not great. It's basically Stone Cold Steve Austin and, and well, Stone Cold Steve Austin. I mean, Triple H has a chance to prove that he's not his scumbag father-in-law by keeping the ball rolling for Cody while juggling the wants of the fans and his performers who also want the spotlight because let's be honest, most pro wrestlers are just theater kids at heart. And since we're a year away, let's do some quick, too early, probably gonna be wrong WrestleMania 41 predictions. Cody versus CM Punk versus Rollins versus Universal Champ Gunther, Rhea Ripley's championship versus Bianca's undefeated streak, Jade versus Champion Charlotte, Rock's Samoan Dynasty faction versus Roman's Bloodline crew, that's a follow-up to a January 1st Netflix special, and in the main event of Sunday, with a record-breaking world championship number 17 on the line, John Cena versus Champ Randy Orton. Oh, and it's Cena's last match, win, lose, or draw. All right. It's time for this week's Hard Pass, where we take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go. Like the people's champ belt that The Rock received from Muhammad Ali's wife. Sorry, I can't let this one go. Look, long story short, the people's champ is an ironic nickname that Rocky gave himself when he was a bad guy in the 90s. But before calling himself the people's champ on television, he asked Muhammad Ali for the right to use it. Great story, very touching. Shows you the respect Rocky has for his predecessors. Cool. Fast forward to last week and Ali's widow Lonnie presents Rocky with a custom rock themed belt that says People's Champ on it. Great gift, very touching, shows you the respect the Ali family had for pro wrestling. Cool. We just wished it was an Instagram post on The Rock's social and not some spectacle that made the final boss character look, well, weak and insecure next to Roman. It's like, Rock, you're the real bad guy. Unlike Thanos, you don't need the Infinity Gauntlet. And what's the deal with Rocky being the guy to hold novelty belts? First it was the BMF belt in the UFC, and now the People's Champ belt that I'm sure is going to be sold on WWE's shop sooner rather than later. Look, the crowd chanting on Monday night, this is awkward. This is awkward. Rock all of a sudden getting a belt kink was a weird way to send him off. But hey, this is hard pass. We don't keep shame around here, but you all have to admit, that was a weird turn for his character. All right. 
That's going to do it for the show. Thank you guys for watching Hard Pass. I'm Jacques Slade coming to you live from Paris. I'll see you next week. If you'd like to possibly be featured in a future episode, call us at 818-493-9325. Leave a short message, your socials if you want, no more than 30 seconds. All right, I'll see you guys soon. Peace.